Welcome to the Fighting on Film podcast, the podcast all about classic and obscure war movies, from the Normandy landings to the days of chivalry and swords. If it's been captured on film, we're going to try and cover it. I'm Robbie of RM Military History. I'm Matthew Moss of Historical Firearms and the Armourer's Bench. Hello, welcome back to Fighting on Film. Now, last week, if you follow us on Twitter, you'd have seen that we mentioned um, about our Patreon and we ran a poll to choose a film for this week. There were some great choices up there. We had Sea of Sand, The Outpost, 55 Days at Peking, and CG Adatville. And the poll ran for a few days and it was a close call. It was it was neck and neck between Sea of Sand and CG Adatville. And a few days ago, CG Adatville just, just came over the line. So thanks very much. Um, to the patrons for this one it was always on the list yeah oh yeah of course it was always it was always going to be a, a good one to cover yeah yeah you know, i'm glad i'm glad it's now come up sooner rather than later exactly and don't worry all the films that were on that poll um will be covered um eventually um we've also got a guest lined up for one of them and if you want to join us on the patreon and support the, the podcast please do you'll find us at fighting a film at patreon.com so please do sign up if you'd like to so matt 2016 cg Adatville. Yeah, what a film. Interesting mm, one. Very... Not something I expected Netflix to ever make, to be honest. No, um, yeah. I never really thought of Netflix as a company that would be willing to make a war film. Mm. So, And I was quite pleasantly surprised by just how good it was. Yeah, really good. No fat at all. Like a proper trim, lean, well put together a war slash action film. Yeah. It's really rare that it doesn't outstay its welcome. It hasn't got many ulterior motives behind it or anything like that it is just trying to tell the story of these men who bravely fought off a far superior force and were kind of forgotten about until about 2005 when a book came out yep. i'm not saying they were completely forgotten about at all but the general consciousness but something we'll discuss later on isn't it the, the, mm. the story is more or less suppressed by the irish government yeah of course um, yeah and they were called yadatville jacks weren't they exactly. yadatville jacks. Uh, there was a, a stigma around them surrendering spoilers unfairly unfairly we might add oh definitely yeah um yeah. so it's a really interesting film it follows the five day siege at if you're pronouncing it the french or belgian way i suppose it's jadeville jadeville yeah um and then there's the the radio op in the film has a great pronunciation of it it's jadeville jadeville that's like me though <laughs> jadeville is something isn't it yeah it's, it's jadeville Jadot- yeah, yeah. <laughs> um and it follows uh, the 157 men of uh, the a, a company of the 35th Battalion uh, from the Irish Defence Forces under the command of the UN Peacekeeping Force in the Congo. Mm-hmm. Uh, and for a little bit of historical context, basically what happened was Katanga, uh, a region of the, the newly independent Democratic Congo, mm-hmm. uh, tried to secede. And there were various political wranglings around the cessation of, mm. of, of that region because of its mining and mineral deposits, etc. Yeah. And, you know, there was a lot of push back and forwards between the West and, and uh, Soviet involvement People as well. People are clambering apparently. for influence and assets. Yeah, and it's a bit like of that. one of it's one of those classic power struggles. It's an irony, really, that you're in that post-colonial age, yet you've got the, a fresh scramble for Africa going on. Yeah. It follows uh, this small company holding a UN outpost uh, against an overwhelming force, about 3,000 Congolese, I think, gendarmes and uh, and mercenaries, foreign mercenaries that were involved. Um, It's an interesting film, mostly based on Declan Powers' 2005 book, uh, Siege of Shadowville, The Irish Army's Forgotten Battle, which is kind of instrumental in pushing the Irish government to officially... You know, mm. recognize the the feat of arms that these guys undertook defending that village for five days. Fans to to the the podcast and, and avid listeners will remember we covered a film that uh, is set in the Congo crisis before, um, Dark of the Sun. We covered back in Merck month. Um, so this is almost reverse Dark of the Sun. You know, yeah, it's other other side of the coin, isn't it? Really, you know, the Mercs are the bad guys in this one. You know, they're not necessarily the good guys in Dark of the Sun, but they're mm. definitely the the bad guys in this one. We'll, we'll rattle through the cast like we usually do. So we have Jamie Dornan as Commandant Pat Quinlan. Um, he's known, probably best known for being the, you know, the sadomasochist loving Mr. Grey from those 
those films, uh, the the Grey series or the trilogy or whatever they, whatever it was called. Fifty Shades of Grey. I don't that, know. I've never 50 seen Fifty Shades. Any, but... That's the one. You can, oh, you can tell the demographic we've got. Um, <laughs> <laughs> crikey! And then he was also an anthropoid. Yeah, he was Jan Kubis, wasn't he? Jan Kubis. That's it. Yeah, in that one. Um, and then we have Mark Strong, uh, who plays Connor Cruz O'Brien. And, you know, people, he was in, like, tons. You know, he's been in Tinker Tailor, Soldier Spy. He was recently in 1917. Um, he's in Six Days, another Netflix yeah. film. Um, but he has a wig in it, and it's really off-putting. <laughs> it's very <laughs> distracting at times, and he plays a bit of a bastard as well. He and, does play a bit of a bastard. And Connor Cruz O'Brien a, is, a, is an interesting character, to say the least, politically mm. speaking. Mm. Um, and I, I couldn't even begin to say whether Strong's sort of performance of him is yeah. accurate i couldn't even just i couldn't even if the direction was be swarthy mark then he's playing it off to an absolute t <laughs> so we've got danny sapani as president sean bay um you know the, the the leader of katanga yeah and he was ricky in ultimate force um fans of that itv um sas drama um you know recognize i did not him. recognize him but i do fondly remember ultimate force from my childhood he was the sort of, he was always cracking jokes in it. You know, he was like one of the, the banter merchants. Yeah, I do. I do remember him. Mm. And he was also, I think he played one of the, the care workers in the Channel 4 series, Misfits. That's what I remembered him from. Oh, did he? Okay. Yeah, yeah. He's he's good actor. I really like him. He is, yeah. He's good in this. He plays the president really well in yeah, this. Yeah, it's, it's this sort of like suave evilness to him. I really like the, yeah. the delivery. And then we've got Sam Keeley, who plays uh, Bill Reddy, the sniper. Um, and he was also an anthropoid with with Jamie Dornan, so we like the little connection there. Nice little link. Guillaume Cane, who plays Rene Falks, the the mercenary leader, and you know he's a real person. Um, you know, as um, everyone in in the movie is is a, is is portrayed, is a real person. I think I read that his actual the guy he's based on his first name was Roger. Right. Okay. I mean, I know he won a Croix de Guerre in the Second World War with the Free French. And he's got a French Foreign Legion um, paratroop badge on on his on his um, yes, he barry, does. doesn't he? Plays it really well. Yeah, very cool. Denison Smock with sleeves rolled up. You know he means business the minute you see him. Then you've got uh, Jason O'Mara as Sergeant Jack Pendergast, JP, and he won an Irish Film and TV Award for Best Supporting Actor for this. And then an interesting one: um, Pat Quinlan's uh, grandson actually has a cameo in the film. He's uh, Connor Quinlan. He plays uh, PJ. And he has a little line where he says, Quinlan's going to get us all killed. Oh, that's him. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I love that. I didn't know that. So, they're, yeah. they're in a they're in a, a slit trench and he, it's just after the first or second that's attack. It. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, I just thought that's really interesting that they gave him that line. It's a nice little one, isn't it? It's a nice yeah. little family thing there. I like it. So production, it was released by Netflix in October 2016. You know, I was when it came out, I was like, oh. Netflix done a war film. The trailer was good. I I remember watching the trailer and being, oh, okay. Mm. Um, Directed by Richie Smith, um, who directed, who's directed mainly music videos. He's an interesting one. Yeah. For The Verve and U2, like big names, you know, big, Mm. big bands. This is his first film. Yeah. First feature, which is, which is impressive. Anyone who's seen it, I mean, I assume everyone listening has seen it. If you haven't, please set aside the hour and 40. Well worth your time for a Netflix film. I mean, obviously it got a cinematic release first, but for a Netflix movie, it's it's up there. I think you know for for cinematography and, and just production values, it's really high up there. Cinematography was done by uh, Nicholas Summer. Some of those shots were really nice. You know, we got uh, some interesting overhead shots. We have some really nice sorts of landscape establishing shots, which yeah, you know, capture the beauty of the area and caption action. Yeah. In, a, in a pre-kinetic way. The sense of scale is really good as well. Yeah, Like You do is. feel like they're outnumbered. You know, and you get some really nice aerial shots of the actual compound that they're on. And there's a lot of close-to-the-ground shots looking mm. up towards the, you know, the approaching uh, mercs and stuff. And that's, that's really effective too, I thought. Yeah, it is. I, re- I like it. And then, you know, Jamie Dornan and co. were put through a boot camp in South Africa beforehand. Yeah. Um, so, you know, they're all trained up and they... You know, I think they do a really good job of portraying the men that they're meant to be portraying. You kind of ignore the fact that it's Jamie Dornan. With a moustache. With a moustache, yeah. yeah. Which, it, look, it looks great. I think it's really... He, it's a good moustache. Yeah, I yeah. I mean, that's... You've just... We've ruined my alley pick already, but... That's <laughs> <laughs> that his moustache is your alley pick. Fair enough. <laughs> he's good in this film. He's he's solid in this. And, really solid. Yeah. Um, Quinlan's family even said that he got his he got him pretty spot on. Mm. The only thing they could really comment on was that his his accent wasn't 
wasn't strong enough. You, right. you know, you have the, the the strong Kerry accent that Quinlan apparently had. Right. I mean, I think he's, he's doing a good job, though. You know, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a aficionado on the Irish dialect, but the uh, his family said they would have had to have um, subtitled him if they, if he'd actually <laughs> oh, gone gone for the accent. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Which I thought was very funny. It's great. Well, it's it's a last stand movie, isn't it? It's it's the classic last stand movie. It kind of reminds me of sort of an Irish We Were Soldiers. Oh yeah, okay. Both based on books, both yeah. based on last stand actions, and they both have that sort of short but just about effective scenes where um, Quinlan is you know with his wife, and it's given it a little bit of emotional uh, jeopardy, and it sort of sets it up uh, with his men. And then it's it's just pretty much full on action for the majority yeah. of the film, isn't it? I mean, once they get to the Congo, they're they're in Jadaville, they're they're digging in, and then almost immediately the they're, they're under attack. And as we said earlier, I think it, it it's quite interesting that that it has no B plot. It kind of has a B plot, but everything is so interlinked that it all is sort of one big through line for me. Mm. The UN diplomats trying to do their thing behind the scenes, and then you've got. Quinlan and his men actually doing the groundwork yeah. and seeing it how it actually is. And you've got the diplomats trying to sort of spin how it is. You know, I like yeah, that. Yeah. I like that. But there's no romantic subplot. You know, there's no people back home worrying if their loved ones are going to make it out, you know, like mm-hmm. We Were Soldiers has. It's very trim. Being trim is its saving grace in a way. You're not not in a bad way. You know, there's no there's no bump. It's just straight to the point. And I really like that. Exactly. It's very much straight to the point, as you say. So it begins with uh Quinlan and his men traveling out to the Congo and they arrive at, at Jadaville and yep. it's completely open. There's no defenses, there's no perimeter, there's absolutely nothing at all prepared. Mm-hmm. And it's it'd been a UN position for quite a while and it was you know well recognized by uh, the mercenaries that were, you know they were up against. Yeah. Um. So immediately Quinlan orders his men to dig a perimeter. That's some it. Slit trenches. Um. And we get this great little scene where they go into like um what what is it, sort of like a makeshift unit armory. That's it. Um. Yeah. What a great shot that is. Yeah. And there's there's vickers and there's a load of rifles piled and there's some ammo boxes and um, a couple of Swedish Ks. It's a it's a taster of what's to come. Mm. Um. In what can only be, be described as a plethora of alley, quite spectacular, which we'll come to and probably will take up most of the show. <laughs> <laughs> it probably will be quite a lengthy alley one this week. You know, then Dawn realizes, oh, we haven't got many supplies to sustain ourselves. So Plastic they go out. UN helmets. Yeah, you know, iconic. And then they go out into the town and they, they get supplies for themselves. Then they meet the mercenaries and they have. They do. They go and have a drink in the local bar and. Very tense drink in the bar. Very, t- very tense. They sort of have a little little spa don't they a verbal spa yeah um, and yeah. set drinking hennessy yeah um yeah and dawn and sort of concludes it with a jibe at the the, the french commander that the germans took over his country in two weeks <laughs> yeah yeah and you, you could just see like falks just seething at that can't yeah. you you know yeah. and then when obviously he's doing some more research on that well, this man want to cry the gear you know he knows what it's like to fight the germans that line's really mm-hmm. gonna stick in his craw i really got i really like that um and then all, and all hell breaks loose, literally, about five minutes later. Yeah, they get back. He, weirdly, he goes off to a lady's house and makes a phone call, which is kind of... Maybe it's just don't, there's a better line, possibly. Yeah, I, I think it's just to keep that connection with his wife. So when we see yes. her at the end, we remember who she is. Yeah, I think you're probably right there. That's that's it. And then mm. from, after that one scene, there's none, really. Yeah. And then we have all those interesting sort of bits with the UN and... Connor Cruz O'Brien being sent on the mission to to head up the UN peacekeeping force, yeah. and he decides to to embark on an operation that will take back certain key points within the region um, from Contangan control, and that goes tits up really spectacularly. <laughs> in which, yeah. and it did in fact that happened. So it's a it's a representation of the UN troops did open fire on on that i think it's a radio station or television station yeah radio katanga that's it radio katanga it's operation it, morthal that they're on that's it morthal yeah and it's sort of alluded to by the f- film that conor cruz o'brien covered up or ordered it covered up yeah immediately which i don't know whether that happened i haven't read into it enough to know for sure 
and the film basically yeah. suggests that the attack on Jadaville is a uh, response to that. Yeah, almost like, like a reprisal attack. Mm. Yeah, mm. Um, yeah. But as we, you know, as we've said before on the pod, you know, the, the Congo crisis was was you know the, the the imagery coming out of that region at the time is horrific. You know, and hugely just... complex, hugely visceral. Yeah. So, I think the alley tally this week is going to be a belter. So I think we should get into it quick. It's time for Ali Tally on Fighting on Film. So, Matthew, as our resident firearms expert, you should go first. Every week, we dive into these films and try and pick out the cool and interesting kit that pops up in them. That's the whole point of the Ali Tally. I don't know whether we've had a film that has quite so many historic interesting firearms in it this film is pretty impressive we've got all sorts in this my number one pick is the the carl gustaf uh, m45 submachine gun that it's beautiful an iconic swedish um submachine gun that was developed after the war and was used by a number of nations including ireland actually the uk almost adopted it um, oh wow okay Wow. Yeah, we, we looked at it alongside the Sterling submachine gun, which we eventually picked. I mean, thank God for um, you, they, they picked the Sterling when you've written a yeah, book. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I'd, write, I'd write a book on the Swedish K. That'd be cool. But that's just the tip of the iceberg with this film. It really um, is. It really is. There's, there's a handful of the Irish troops that are armed with the, the Swedish K. Mm. And there's some really great shots of them, of them firing it from the hip, running around, which is completely um, legitimate. Uh, was in the manual. Um, and there's even a scene where um, JP, the sergeant, um, Jason Nomara, fixes a bayonet. Is that a number and four that, bayonet? I, I, I think it might be. It I'm, looks like I'm not sure. It's so brief. I didn't I didn't quite catch it, but I just noticed he had one fixed. And I was oh, like, it's so cool. Nice. Because nice. that's it. When they, when they look like they're going to be properly overrun, they will mm. start sort of fixing bayonets a little bit. Yeah. You get that shot of him, and he's got it on pretty much the end of the movie. And I'm like, just let him use it once, please. You know, it's just like, <laughs> it looks so cool. I guess my other pick would be the the sniper, which yeah. I know we're going to discuss a little bit more. But he's mm-hmm. yeah. he's um, yeah. he's left handed. He's got a um, yeah. a British uh, Lee Enfield rifle number four T. It's nice to have some left handed shooting representation because me is, and Matt yeah. are both left handed shooters. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I noticed he was running it. He was running the ball in that sort of classic left handed cack handed way. I know, I know um, how it. I know exactly how it's mm-hmm. done, but to someone who's listening, go, go, look it up because it is a very odd way we have to do the bowls on on rifles. Yeah. He is just money throughout this. He is, he is a force multiplier throughout this. He is knocking people down left, right, and centre. He's into he's accuracy international personified, isn't he, this boy? <laughs> he is knocking people down at all different oh, ranges. Yeah. Um, when he's not on the the um, the the number four T, he's he's on the Vickers yeah. one at one point. He infamously calls for the Bren. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's great. It's just, it's, it's really good. And you get a lovely shot of the, the, the proper reticule of the you scope. You do, yeah, you do, yeah. You get the little the trope post. Of looking through a, a scope, but you actually get the right scope. What more do you want? I mean, for, for me, Matt, though, I mean, it's just, you know, it's number four Lee Enfield. It's FN Fowls, a Vickers gun mounted on a Land Rover, Bren guns. Um, 37 slash 44 pattern webbing that the guys are yeah, wearing yeah. even down to the the mercenaries so obviously I mentioned earlier Falks has got his denison but all of his troops are just wearing this like odd mishmash of like dress sort of like dress uniforms and DPM yeah. one of them is wearing DPM at one point yeah, which, which is I'm, yeah not quite I, right but... if you know the meme from um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood where a DiCaprio sort of points at the screen <laughs> it's, that was me with the DPM I was like DPM <laughs> um, but you, but they have a mad amount of like different amount of weapons. So some of them have got SMLEs, some of yep. them have got um, K98Ks. Yep. You know, there's they have 50 cows mounted on Land Rovers, 30 calibers, lots of Mauser rifles, um, three inch mortars. <laughs> yeah, three inch mortars, like a whole troop of them mounted on Land Rovers. It's so Very cool. impressive. I mean, if they could mount it on a Landy, it was mounted on a Landy. It was. There was a, uh, a Dushka, there was a, a Browning 50 cal. Um, it's just so much. <laughs> a lot of a lot of GPMGs mounted on on Land Rovers. I think Dornan didn't draw it, but I think he probably had a Browning high power in that. 
He did draw it and he does shoot did he it. Draw it? Oh, yeah, at the, the end, he runs out the back of the petrol station, oh, of which is where he in, does. Yeah. And he fires a few rounds out the back door. Oh, come on. It's very good. I was like, oh, yes, look at that. And a couple of the mechs have them as well. But the cream always rises to the top of the Ali Taliban. And we, we couldn't get away with it without mentioning the Bedford RLs. Oh, so good. I was live tweeting. If if you if you're a fan, fan of the Twitter and you follow us, I I had a late night movie session. At tweeted, fighting on film. At fighting on film, yeah. And I tweeted. Um, I was live tweeting the film, and the beddies came on, and I sort of I didn't tweet it initially. I just sat there and basked in the beddies for a little bit, and then I was like, Bedford RLs, guys, come on, you know what the alley tally's going to be for this week. Yeah, painted at white. UN. UN Bedford RLs. Oh, beautiful, just beautiful. And then I think you see um. I think you see some um, UN painted up um, land landies as well, which is always yeah, nice. Yeah, uh, uh, Pendergast uh, goes That's off it, to yeah. report to the uh, local commander. Mm. In There's one just of them. something about the the UN like blue berets as well, and the, the white yeah vehicles and, and things. I always like. I that. really like the the little um, arm band type deal with um, the rank insignia on. I, mm. I don't know what the the proper name for that is. No, there no. is a proper name. It's, but... a, it's a brassard, isn't it? Called a brassard. I don't know. Yeah, maybe perhaps. Because yeah. I, I, you have I'm gas not... brassards, don't you? Which look kind of sort of similar. Okay. In the first one, in the second world war, the BAF had gas brassards that look a bit like that, but without okay. rank on. So maybe that's yeah. what it's based off of. I don't know. Quinlan has the wrong insignia on. He has the right oh. commandant um, insignia for his rank insignia on his um, on his shoulder, but on it on his. Um, on the whatever that thing is called, <laughs> um, he has like the the, the a, a private sort oh, of outline, yeah, and it looks like looks like the the private insignia has been taken off. Maybe that was like an infield thing, you know. Maybe they just didn't. Yeah, have it might well have been. It's just a, yeah. I just I just appreciated the aesthetic value of that one. I don't know whether it's accurate or not, but I liked it. <laughs> it's a it's a not really alley, but I like the little inclusion. It's like the little set dressing. Um, when they yeah, the mise en scène in this yeah, film is pretty good really for good. what wouldn't have been a huge budgeted no, film. They couldn't find the budget, and it annoyed me. Well, they blow up a whole. They blow up the whole set basically, yeah, they don't do. they? they really so do. it's pretty good, yeah. and it definitely isn't miniature work. Um, yeah, there's a there's a little bit where Quinlan's had the first engagement, and he looks at his bed in in the in the little barracks. Yeah, and he's got all yeah. these World War Two books like Rommel, you know, the yeah. war to end the war, World War Two. So he, just throws, <laughs> like, nope. yeah, he just throws them away you know he eats them away you're like and i like that it's a nice little um it is yeah you know but i think the one thing we'll have to talk about and we can't get away with it this week is the bren being used as a marksman not right definitely but before we get to the bren before right. we get there we need to do honorable mentions okay. because there's some fantastic stuff that we haven't mentioned yet um one mech has an m1919 uh medium machine gun set up like an m1919 stinger now a stinger uh, was something that uh one or two u.s marine corps units yeah. made during yeah. the pacific campaign and it's basically uh adding a stock and a, a forward sort of hand hole yeah. um above the barrel so you can fire from the hip and he's briefly seen and it's just just like what the hell why has he got one of those yeah yeah well, they're mercenaries, aren't they? They can have what they want, pretty they much. They can have what they want. So there's loads of guys with, with um, FN Mag GPMGs. And then there's a couple of submachine guns that I've got to mention. There's a little bit where um, Falks has a Mat 49, a couple of um, the mechs with Franchi LF-57s, which yeah. are very, really very like... obscure Italian submachine guns. Boot camp is in South Africa, so they might have filmed it in South Africa. I'm not too sure. I think they did. Yeah, the whole yeah. thing was was done in South Africa. I think crazy. Like we when we did um, uh, Bravo Two Zero, that was shot in South Africa, wasn't it? And yeah. they get some crazy armory yeah. in that. But this is next level. So uh, I mean, I read on one website that some of the um, the Swedish Ks were actual Swedish Ks that had been used by UN forces. Oh wow! At some point, whether that's true or not, I don't know. But I thought that was interesting. I just really love the iconic sort of profile and aesthetic of the of the, the Swedish case. It's a really interesting little gun. Yeah, it really is. Um, and finally, there's a Belgian submachine gun, uh, the Vegenal, because mm. where else are you going to see one of those yeah, other yeah. than in a film about the former Belgian Congo? Yeah, it's someone's really done their research. and someone's yeah, really, it's, it, You can tell someone's really enjoyed putting these guns on screen. I would agree with that, yeah, definitely. But I did notice that um, Quinlan or Dornan's uh, rifle was fully auto 
Yeah, he does you fire a few burns. Eyes fall auto thing. a couple of times, mm. and the recoil is not representative of what a false <laughs> recoil would be like. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I I I, re- I looked at all a couple of my like reference books, and I couldn't find any mention of what the Irish contract um, files were. But I think they were British inch pattern SLRs, which John Ferguson from the Royal Armouries was kind enough to confirm for me as well. Yeah. Um, but there's some brilliant stuff in this. It's really good. But yes, we do have to talk about yeah the sniper Bren. <laughs> so I, I tweeted up, and I think I said, you know, oh, I don't know, but if he, you know, swapping out his, his scopely Enfield for a Bren with a single shot in it at the range that he seems to be firing at, yeah. seems very odd. So we had a you know a bona fide celebrity, very well respected Nicholas Moran, chief of U.S. Army and I think Irish Defence Force yeah. veteran. Yeah, works for World of Tanks. You know, people know him from his channel on, on YouTube. So he replied to us on, on that tweet. So he said, you may underestimate the reputation that the Bren had for accuracy in the Irish military to the point that the shooting competitions with it had to have rules to penalise single shot fire. The weight and solid bipod lean to accuracy at the cost of flexibility to the Lee Enfield. That's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's really interesting. And the Bren does have this sort of mythical status as being almost too accurate mm. that's the common trope of the bren yeah people often say that it's too accurate for a light machine gun because of its rate of fire and all that sort of just, thing just because of the of, of um its barrel harmonics the rate of fire and the design itself mm. it's it's truly an, an excellent design yeah i mean I'm still used by some nations around the world today that whole scene is a bit i, I don't want to say it's untrue because obviously you could make that shot with the bren it's just it's, unusual it's, it's just, just it's a really odd one, isn't it? The scene is there's a there's a big wave attack yeah. from the um, the mercenaries. The, it's like the, the second t- wave, forces. isn't it? It is, yeah. yeah. And the I think planter slash maybe mayor of Genevieve. I thought he was like a mining company. He is, head yeah. He's guy. definitely like a yeah, yeah, a, mi- a mining. He's got this planter white slash... linen suit on, you know, he's a, exactly. You know. And he's he's paying. He's he says, you know you're paying for us, so yeah. we'll go and do the attack. Um, Pal- Palak's that is. Yep. And he sort of stood next to a little school building about, mm. oh, I don't know, like 400 yards away from the yeah. from the UN compound. 500, yeah, you can see it. Yeah. There's shots in the film where Dornan's looking through some binoculars and it's mm. in the foreground, but it's it's a focus shot, so it's blurred out. But it's clearly not that far away. You know, it'd probably take you a couple of minutes to walk over to it, sort of distance. That's what I was assuming. Yeah. Yeah. And then your marksman shouts, he says, Oh, can you make can, the man in the white suit? Can you make a shot on him? Can you get a shot off on this guy? Yeah. And the cool as you like, you know, Bill, Bill's like, Yeah, bring me up a Bren. His exact words are, Yeah, with the Bren on single shot. Yeah, it's a very well, edi- well edited, well choreographed little sequence. Mm. He pulls out the mag. Racks back the, the the charging handle. Very nice bit of cinematography on that. A bit nice bit of camera work. So he sort of like single loads the round, doesn't uh, it? I slowed it down and it's an insert round. So oh, it's an in it. Oh wow, yeah, it's okay. an in it round. Yeah, oh. um, but it's Didn't all right. that. Good eye, Rob. <laughs> I I had to pause and look. Um, <laughs> oh, is the primer? Is the primer already? Yeah, the primer's already been fired. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's break this down practically oh my gosh so we're doing a 500 yard shot right which the lee enfield can easily make even with the lee enfield can engage targets out to 700 yards no bother with the scope yeah, yeah it can engage them out further if you if you know what you're doing um i've made i've made a bull on a six foot target <laughs> that's a flex <laughs> 800 yards with iron sights yeah. yeah okay yeah i mean i grouped it like 600 or something yeah, so it's, it's, not, it's, it's, it's and I'm not yeah. I'm not a regular no, shooter. No, me neither. I know how to shoot, but I'm not. You know, I'm not. A, I'm not a um, an expert marksman. The number four is going to be inherently more accurate. It has a scope. Yeah, yeah. it's a um, magnified scope. It's a magnified scope, and it's a rifle that has its bolt closed when it fires. So, with a bolt action rifle, to load the round in, you push the bolt forward, chamber the round, lock the bolt down. Of course. And that's the most stable platform for firing possible compared to the Bren, which is an open bolt machine gun, which means when you load the Bren, you pull the bolt back to the rear and it stays to the rear. Yeah. Then you load the magazine in. And then when you pull the trigger, 
the bolt goes forward, strips around for the magazine, chambers, locks, and then fires. That process of it pulling around, slamming into the bolt face, locking, and then firing means that there's a lot of movement. Right. Even despite the bipod. The number four would have benefited from having a bipod, but he had plenty of sandbags. You don't need a bipod. You know, he had a firing position there. He had the high yeah. ground. And the iron sights on a Bren are not designed for precision shooting. They're a fairly large peep sight with a front post. And they show that in the film, which is really nice. Yeah, they do. Yeah, only from what Nicholas tweeted us. But I can kind of see it in a, in a way, you know, it's got a, it's got a foregrip, it's got a bipod. It's not undoable. You know, the guy the, is a big lump, the guy that he's firing at. He's a big lad yeah, yeah. With, with, a, with a white suit on, on, backed on green jungle. I can see it. It's just yeah. weird. And I think in my head, obviously, this is me coming from years of watching movies where you've got cool of the fuck snipers, you know, like yeah. the, the, the lad as Sarah Porrick, Ryan, you know, the, 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 the guy with the Barrett in Rambo. <laughs> it's sort yeah. of like, you know, snipers are meant to be this cool, cooler than life, you know, bigger than life sort of characters. And for someone to swap out their weapon mid firefight for something that I deem less accurate, even if it isn't. Yeah, it's... in movie terms, is it's a very nice, and very interesting inclusion. But it, I just don't know if it's right or wrong, and I don't want to say if is or isn't. But it's so odd. It kind of it kind of stopped the movie dead for me. I was like, what? Matt messaged me when he was watching it again, and he was like, I just can't get my head around this Bren scene. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can understand the the mythology around its accuracy playing so much into it that um, it became sort of ingrained within the Irish soldiers' sort of appreciation of its abilities. And that's that's where that came from. And maybe, maybe that actually happened. I don't know. I haven't had a chance to read Declan Power's book yeah. um, on, the, on the battle. Perhaps that's something that happened, but I don't know. Otherwise, it's just a, a, an unusual, interesting scene they've been. Well, I assume it must have been. It must have been true, or there must have been a, a story, or a first-hand, a second-hand, third-hand account of it happening for them to mm. include it. Because if not, then it is a bit of a weird one. But it's yeah. a very, it's a very alley inclusion, though. You know, to, to yeah, it's it's interesting, and it's definitely sparked a debate because for years, like as soon as that came, the film came out, people have been talking about the Bren on single shot. Is is it that accurate? Is it accurate enough? To the point where um, Rich and I have been like, yeah, we're going to have to test this. We're going to have to get a, a Bren and, a, and a, um, a number four out to a range. Well, that, that'll be, you know, that'll be the end of it, won't it? But like, hopefully, we're, yeah, write, but, write, yeah, write a paper on it, make a video. <laughs> yeah, we'd be interested to hear what listeners think about this one. And, and Nicholas, obviously, if, you, if you're listening to the pod today, please, you know, tweet us again. I'd love to know more about what the, the Irish uh, Defence Force's sort of appreciation of the Bren was and how it sort of gained that reputation. And it may well be that it is more than capable of doing that at 600 yards or whatever it was. But there's one thing you can't deny it, Matt. He had BBE, big brain energy. He did. He did. So for me this week, I mean, fave scenes, it's more of a fave section because I, I don't, the movie doesn't, it has scenes, but when the battle starts, it's pretty much all battle. Um, yeah, yeah. But I really like that initial engagement. So all the men are at mass, um, you know, in the church and, and mm -hmm. the marksman is out on watch um, and he spies some movement in the in the brush, you know, on, on their perimeter. He half looks, isn't sure. And then he notices that it is a force coming towards them. And he can't, obviously, he can't run down to the church because it's just take too much time. So split second, he, he fires a shot at the bell, or the bell tower of the church, which I really like. Doesn't use the Bren, though, does he? <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> no, didn't use the Bren. But it's a really good shot. You know, you get the big loud ding, and some, some birds are sort of spooked. I really like that sort of trope cliche. Alex comes in firing M1919 off the back of a Land Rover, just laying it down. And all the lads pile out of the church. You know, they've got all their... FN Fowles, Lee Enfields on and their 37 pattern webbing all in nice neat, neat little piles and they're all struggling to get on their webbing. You know, they're sort of being ordered to get in their trenches. The whole thing, the whole setup of this, of the men being there is that they haven't seen action before. You know, they're not expecting to see action either, but obviously Quillen has his doubts after meeting the mercenaries. He thinks, 
you know, we are going to see some action here. Quinlan's having his first um, action under the command of men. The men themselves are green. So you're thinking, oh God, they're going to be overrun. But no, it's a really good sequence of men being frightened, then men settling into it. And then the sort of adrenaline kicking in of um, the sergeant going off to get the Land Rover with the Vickers gun on it to bring forward, bring up some heavier yeah, fire support yeah. to see the Donnan's running around showing, I want fire superiority. It's got a really good sense of like tension and it ramps up. You're like, oh God, they're going to get overrun. No, they're actually, they're trained professional soldiers. They know what they're doing. They're trained for this. They know to bring up their heavy weapons to see off that initial attack. And then they can consolidate. And it's just, I think it's one of the tightest pieces of action battle sequences on on film in the modern era that I've seen. That Yeah, in recent years, it's well up there. Really impressive. I think a really interesting part of that sequence as well is where Quinlan orders 10 of his best men off to the south flank mm. because he expects the enemy to come from the hill. The sergeant, uh, Pendergast, takes the 10 men to the, to the flank. That's it. Takes a position. And realizes no, there's, no, there's no one there. Yeah, that moment where it's showing everyone as being, you know, fallible. Quinlan is, you know, he's had the forethought to dig in, but he isn't. He isn't a combat veteran. He doesn't have the experience. Um, and sending men to that that position is a wise move because yes. you would expect them to come from that position to swing around the back of you and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then it shows this um, Prendergast, uh, Jason Amara's character, deciding, I'll leave three men here, take the rest back. Mm. And that, again, is just men thinking on their feet, which you don't always see in, in war movies. Because he gives that speech at the start where he's like, look, you know, we've not been in combat before. That means we're good at peacekeeping. So that's why they're sending for us, sort of thing. You know, I'm paraphrasing. They get into combat and it has the, the film has the, the, sorry, the screenwriters have enough knowledge and respect for the men that fought the battle to not just show them as flapping, running around, like not knowing what to do. Yeah. The point of your training is to train you up for the actuality of battle. So then when they get in the battle, they actually give them, they show respect to these men that fought really fucking bravely under extreme circumstances and they slot into it very quickly. And it shows Quinlan as a very sort of stoic, you know, lead by the front man yeah. and i'm sure that he was you know reading things about him he sounded like an absolute diamond chap i never felt even when it was on top of them and they were setting demo charges everywhere and making these makeshift bombs out of spent ammo cases and things like that that's I mean, a good scene it's a great scene but i never felt for one moment they were going to get overrun mm. it never felt they was on top of them I, even at the end i was like come on i thought even hand-to-hand combat if it got to it because i admit i didn't know a lot about the siege so when i thought it was going to get hand-to-hand i was like oh they're going to take a few out here by the end of it you, you think these lads would fight you know these lads will fight for weeks and that's why it's a favorite scene for me because it sets the tone of the movie up perfectly i would agree with that one that's a good pick as you said there's there's a couple of interesting bits where he's on the radio and he's you know calling for ammunition and there's a little bit where he says and um, we could do with some whiskey I was doing some digging and I, Quality I it line. is a great line. I was doing some digging and I found that that actually comes from an article in Time Magazine. Ah. I don't know how accurate the Time Magazine quote actually was, but he says, we'll hold out to the last bullet is spent, could do with some whiskey. I don't know whether it appears in the in the radio log that, that Quinlan kept, because yeah. he did in fact keep a, a radio log. And I think I think that was used uh, by by Declan Powell when he was writing his, his book on it. Um, but yeah, it's a good pick. I think for me, it's the scene where they open fire on the uh, the Fuga Magister okay. the jet yep. that's attacking. Yeah. So, okay, there's there's a faith that's a good scene, but there's also a little caveat to this in the okay. Um, Quinlan gets shot in the shoulder. Takes it like a champ. He does. He it doesn't even phase him. Uh, he gets knocked on his ass, um, and he's he's carried off. But he's shot by what looks like a, a Mauser. It might be a K ninety eight K. I'm not sure. I can't remember. But it's definitely a Mauser, and it's definitely firing a 7.92 by 57 millimeter round, which would probably have gone through him at that point. And if he was very unlucky, it probably would have broken his, his collarbone, shoulder, yep. God knows what else. But he's shown as just being knocked down, gets carried away. The surgeon pulls out a little sort of like piece of lead, um, yeah. and then he's back in the fight. He just he got put really on the lucky. smallest bit of sort of bandage. Yeah. And he's back out there running around with his foul. 
Um, he's got really lucky, Matt. It's just these Irish chaps. Really, really lucky. Um, you know, they made a stronger stuff, mate. They're, they're attacked by that Fuga Magister. Yeah. And they're bombing and strafing the, the UN position. And he's on the Vickers. He's on the back of the Land Rover on the Vickers giving it some. And he can't he can't get the hit he wants. He can't get the angle he wants on this this um, this marauding jet. And he's like, help me flip the Land Rover. Like, yes, you would need some help. You've just been shot through the, sh- the shoulder. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, and he does. He, they flip it, and he's on his back on the floor. Sees it off, and he, and he puts a little burst straight into the um, the enemy jet, yeah. and it flies off. The Vickers plays a big role in this film. Like, there's a number of really good scenes with it. Obviously, you, you mentioned uh, the one where Prendergast comes thundering yeah. in yeah. on the back of back of the Land Rover, and Quinlan's like, "Cover that mad bastard!" Yeah, um, <laughs> it's a great scene. And there's a bit where the sniper then switches to the Vickers. Yep. And he's on the roof. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Giving it some. But before we move on to Final Thoughts territory, I I, I can't we, I can't not mention the fact that the movie sort of poises that the, that the US killed the UN General Secretary. That's kind of interesting. So that's up there with yeah. the bit where Connor Cruz O'Brien says, yeah, we'll cover this up. Yeah. That's kind of crazy that, you know, the, the sacrosanct organisation, the UN, the film is portraying them as being willing to, to cover this up. Blink and you'll miss it. The jet comes in. Shoots the, yeah. the, 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 the the you know the airliner down and then you're like hang on a yeah and it's quite clear like an F4 Phantom if it had been a like a, a Fuga Magister yeah I was like that's an F4 Phantom what are they trying to say here mm. Mm. Like, no one in sixty in the early sixties would have had an F4 other than the US it'd be interesting to know why that's in there well it, apparently it is a conspiracy theory uh, okay um, and at the time Truman President Truman said that they had killed him the soviet union right um and then there's conspiracy theories that it was actually um the us that had done it because they weren't particularly happy with how uh dag hammarskjold had actually been you right. know handling the situation and then there's a cia report that says that the kgb were responsible oh my god suspecting that it was a katanga uh, magister that had that shot it down the jet trainer but then how you'd have to be pretty certain that he was on board to shoot it down well it is a big plane with un written on the side of it i suppose perhaps it perhaps it was an accident they were just attacking yeah. a un plane yeah I, I, could, I could buy that completely don't know i don't know too much about it but it's just an interesting inclusion it's a really interesting inclusion and it's it, it's kind of interesting that the film that would be so bold as to portray you know mm. like one of the perhaps more conspiratorial can like theories around it i also like the bit at the end where um dornan meets the general is it general mackety yes and he you know he's saying well, you're all, you're all gonna be court-martialed you know we have to save face and all that and he's just leathers him you know and then he's sort of you know he knows because he's like you know you, you chaps did well and strong's like oh you know are you gonna punish them and he's like no <laughs> <laughs> no why would i you know they fought bravely sort of thing it's final comeuppance for O'Brien's character which I you know at least in the movie he gets some comeuppance I don't know whether he got any in real life it doesn't really seem so possibly not um so you know these lads were as we said at the start you know quite unfairly treated afterwards cover-ups things like that yeah you know but this movie you know they're heroes aren't they nothing else you can say you know extremely bright yeah the, the film the film does a really good job of portraying the action yeah and obviously they'd already been they'd already been like a, a, an irish government irish uh, defense force inquiry in 2004 five into was it really misconduct that yeah. they surrendered um which it clearly wasn't if you yeah. subscribe to I mean, it it was surrender or death i think you know? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, there, there was no messing about there. No. Um, and it rightly they've been sort of vindicated and and um, proven right in in two thousand and five. And then I think when the book came out and subsequent documentaries and then the film and to the Irish government's credit, they've finally you know given all of the veterans and the the, the veterans' families uh, presidential unit citation to really put it on the map that these these men were brave and they you know they they did fought, fight as hard as they could i even read that after the the chaps come out of the prison they were re, when they were sort of getting ready to go back home they were involved in another light engagement a few weeks after yeah it's, the film you know, doesn't actually portray that does it? it sort of suggests that they go straight from the prison and back home 
Yeah, but they did go back into the line and they were there the full six months. Yeah, it's like, you know, in, in, absolutely incredible tour of duty. My whole sort of index for the movie is that movies like this are really important and I think it shows how important the war movie genre can be. You know, not only is the movie, one, a very good movie, you know, it really holds up, you know, it'll hold up 10 years from now, 50 years from now, whatever. It's a really well-made film. But it also documents something that not a lot of people know about, about a conflict that isn't very well known um, yeah. still and it immortalises those men and, and what better use for the war movie genre than something like this yeah I, I completely agree it shows the power of film yeah. to bring something into the popular consciousness agreed and it's exactly along the lines of you know what we always say on the pod war movies are a great medium yeah to sort of break into history and and show people stories that they may not have heard of or not, not know about i just wish more films like this were made and i also think it's great this on netflix and it can be enjoyed by so many people that might not ordinarily have watched it yeah that, that's what i was going to say props to netflix for for making this film so matt, matt any more final thoughts just that it's a, a very solid film with a copious amount of alley in it like someone someone said on uh, twitter i can't remember who it was it's Fifty Shades of Ali, and it definitely is. It's just a very well-rounded film. It's a really good, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it and it tells an important story. Nothing lets it down. I don't actually think. I think it might be the first film we've watched. I haven't got anything negative to say at all. Well, there you go. Can't say more than that, can you? No, you can't. No. So, guys, thanks for joining us. Uh, don't forget to leave a like, a review, or rating on wherever you're listening to the pod do check out our brand new website www.fightingonfilm.com if you're on twitter please do follow us at fighting on film and yeah join us again for some more war movies thanks very much for listening guys and we'll catch you again next week bye bye